Well, good morning. It is good to see you again. Um, just a couple of news because God is doing some amazing things in it. And um, so yesterday we had the men's breakfast and it was really great having the men come out and, and we put most, we got the women's restroom in the fellowship hall put together. Yay, the women can now use the restroom. Men have to go outside behind the bush still. Because, <laughs> you know, we went to go sit the toilets and you know, nothing is easy and they just kind of didn't work. And so um, we're doing some creative things, but we're going to get those in. And then the other thing is, is yesterday afternoon, the bad news is um, Trevon's family experienced a sudden death in their family. And as a result, um, we invited Ben to come and lead us in worship because Trevon's not in a place to do it today. So Ben, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Um, you know, it was just his willingness was, yeah, I lead worship at another church. I've got somebody else who can do my spot. I'll be here for you guys. How can I help? And what a, what a great, what a great testimony of the body of Christ saying, Hey, there's somebody hurting in the body of Christ. We're going to come alongside and we're going to help. And, um, so Ben, thank you. And pray for Trevon as his family just walks through this very challenging, horrible valley that they plummeted them found themselves plummeted into. And then, um, so on the other side, there are some good things that God is doing. Wednesday night, we had um, our Bible study, but we didn't have our Bible study Wednesday night. It, it was a great celebration of a marriage. And we just came in and we celebrated Richie and Angelica's wedding. They got married a month ago. So where's, where's, hey, Angelica, yay! You know, and it's the church coming alongside and saying, you know what? We're going to throw you a party because we really want to support and encourage um, marriage. And we want to encourage you to and um, come alongside you as you walk in your journey. And what a healthy thing for the church to do. Just come alongside and say, we're going to come alongside. We're going to help this family. And so um, for those of you who helped pull that off and helped make that happen, praise the Lord for you guys. And God is doing some great things in this church. All right. With that being said, you're going to ultimately want to go to 2 Samuel chapter 11 in the passage. And we're going to get there. But I've got to tell you a quick little story to get you there. There was a telemarketer. Marketer, he called a home one day. He's probably going to try to sell, um, you know, long-term car insurance. What's that thing where they call you up and say, hey, you want a car warranty forever? And the telemarketers, we've all had those calls about 50 times, right? And so this telemarketer calls this house. And, he, and this little kid, small voice whispers, hello. And the telemarketer says, hi, what's your name? And the whispering voice says, Johnny. How old are you, Johnny? Says the telemarketer. I'm four. Uh, four? Eh, well, well, Johnny, is your mom home? Yes. Can I speak with her? She's busy. Okay. Um, the telemarketer says, well, is your dad home? Yes. Well, can I speak to your dad then? He's busy. And so the telemarketers go, okay, are there any other adults in the room? And the little Johnny says, yes, the police are here. <laughs> and so the telemarketer says, can I speak to them? No, they're busy. <laughs> are there any other adults there? And the little Johnny says, yes, the firemen are here. <laughs> And the telemarketer says, well, can I speak to the firemen? And the voice says, no, they're busy. And the telemarketer says, well, what are they doing there? They're searching for me. <laughs> uh, that's a good, simple joke that we can tell, and you guys can pass that along for free. And, and the, you know, the idea is little Johnny, he's there hiding. He's hiding and, and he's trying to keep things away from other prying eyes. And in first in Second Samuel chapter eleven, that's exactly kind of what David does. David tries to hide, and though well, he tries to hide his sin, he tries to hide this very act, this, this this horrible thing that he had done, this adultery that he committed, and ultimately the murder that he does. He's trying to hide it, and he does a pretty good job. Ultimately, at the end of the chapter, you think that that David has done it successfully. He's hidden. He's he's got it all covered. But there's a verse I'm going to want you to underline and I'm going to want you to highlight at the end of the service. So well, let's, you know, um, Ben did a great job of having us sing. And so your voices are welcome. And I'm going to read this. And then I want us to read this together because I just got crazy with the D's up here. If you can read it, it says, David's delightful days are diminished with disheartened desires and dubious dreaded decisions. Okay. And I want us to read that together. Okay. I'm going to count us down. Tommy's going, no, I can't do it. So you're ready. 
Three, two, one. David's delightful days are diminished with disheartened desires and dubious. Well done. Can you do that five times in a row really quick? Like, I don't know, but that, that kind of says what's going on. And, and the writer of 2 Samuel, he's going to point out something. This is, where, this is where we've been walking with David for a couple of months. This is where, if you will, the plummet starts. This is where things just are indicated. And, and from here on out, David's life will, will be forever changed. And so David has the presence of God. If you remember, he has the presence of God with him. And, and such that he, he was looking out of his palace window and he looked over there and he sees, he sees the ark of God inside of a tent. First, he brought the ark. Remember, he brought the ark into the place and, and now it's in a tent. And now the presence of God, the ark of God is in the city of Jerusalem. Oh, David is so excited because God's presence is in the city. Oh, David has experienced, if you remember, great victories. All the Ikes are defeated. The Amalekites, the Prezocytes, the Amorites, all the Ikes are gone. And, and so David has seen great victory in his battles. And so he's, he, the presence of God is there. The victories are there. The promise of God. God. And remember a couple of weeks ago, the Davidic covenant, where David, David is promised by God. And God doesn't say, you know, it doesn't matter the tent, whether I'm in a tent or whether I'm in a temple. What matters is you're going to have a son forever, forever on the throne. And so the promise to David, David, David experienced it because God, David saw God removed the kingdom from Saul to David. And David you know, if I build him a tabernacle, if I build him a temple, maybe, maybe God won't remove it. And instead, God says, don't worry about that. I'm forever going to be with your descendants, David. Oh, there's a promise in that. And, and David's heart, David's heart was fantastic. And last week, we looked at there's the disabled son of Jonathan coming in on crutches. You can hear the clicking of the crutches on the marble floors as he comes in and he sits underneath the table at the king's table because David adopted Mephibosheth and, and he adopted him and brought him into the family. Oh, what a great heart. Who doesn't love a king who, who has the, brings the presence of God, who has great victories, who, who has this promise of God, who has the heart of, for the hurting. Oh, David is just looking fabulous and we've seen them. Ever since Goliath, we've seen its trajectory go high. The fall is going to come hard. David has the prompt prayer, promise, and people. There's something about David where he just, it's just all going well. You know, and I, my, I, I thought about this message and I've tried to think through, is this message just simply about David and Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, or is there something in it for us? Do we, do we think, okay, we've got prayer, okay, we've got the promise, and we're good to the people of God? Is there something in this message for us? I think there is. I think it's greater than just an adulterous relationship. I think there's a truth in here that we need to unpack. And it starts like this. In the very first words of chapter 11 says, And it happened. Uh, that's the very first words that are in there, Hebrew. You're going to see it repeats it twice. And you're going to see, and it happened. And it happened. And so, so in other words, at one time. They don't know specifically the moment that it happened. And it happened. And the writer gives us this idea. And it happened. Same Hebrew word, verse 1 and verse 2. And it happened. In the springtime, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men. And the whole Israelite army. And so what would happen back then, agrarian culture, it, farming was a very important. People lived off the farm. And so early, what they'd do is they'd plant all the fields. And then they'd get the guys together and they'd go have battles. But they wouldn't have battles without planting the fields, without, without farming the land first. And so it would farm the land first, get the seeds in the ground, and then you go out to battle. You don't have it in the middle of winter. You have it in the springtime. And the springtime's when the kings go to war. And look at, it doesn't say David. David sent Joab out with that. He sent Joab. And he sent all of the army and all of the army and Joab. What did they do? They saw great victories. And they besieged Rabbath and the Ammonites. And in other words, they were seen victory over there. And where's David when Joab is out fighting? And the text says, but. But if you got your Bible, you want to circle that word, but. Because that, that always, there's, there's a contraction. But, this is going on, but. And then, oh, you've got to read carefully. You've got to look carefully what happens. But David remained in Jerusalem. 
Joab's out there. He's fighting. He, he's seen victory. And David, maybe he took a stress week off. I don't know. And David is just hanging out. Same word, as it happened. Same word there. The very beginning of verse 2. One evening, David got up from his bed. One evening. Not, not early in the morning. He, he wasn't waking up in the morning having his devotion time. He was sleeping in, and then, he, then, then all of a sudden he took a long nap. And one evening, this is kind of the late night. The sun is setting. One evening, and David's in his PJs, and, and you know he's getting up. Oh, what's out the window, he's going to say. right? He walks around the roof of his palace, and from there he saw a woman bathing. Yeah, uh-oh is right. And David just doesn't look at that and go, oh, interesting. David looks at that and goes, hey. He looks and he looks. And, and as I thought about this, David was a man. Well, we'll get to David's character in a second. And it happened. And the woman was very beautiful. And now what happens? Did you see that next highlighted word? And David sent someone to find out about her. His first, his first mistake. There it is. There she is. And he chooses to dwell on it. Now, David, David has is, is been living, if you will, in one area of kind of open secret in his life. An open secret in his life is David has not been following God's plan in one area of his life. And David has multiple wives. Before he marries Bathsheba, he has 17 wives. He doesn't just have one wife. He probably has some concubines as well, but he has 17 wives. Remember the story when, when he went and had one of his, his, one of his first wives, uh, one of the daughters of Saul? Remember he, he ripped Saul's daughter out away from her husband so he could get her? This isn't a story just about sex. And David, David um, he, he could have sex whenever he wanted to with any of his wives, maybe concubines. This is a story about David having an issue where it's out of control in his life. One area that he has not surrendered to God. One area that he has, he has allowed this area of his life to be completely out of control, to be in disobedience to God. Oh, he's got, he's got all the prayers, right? He's seen victory. He's, seen, he, he's taking care of the, he's doing some things, but in this area of his life, he doesn't have any control. This is going to hurt him tremendously. And I wonder if there is an area in your life, before we get too far, Oh, you, you're, you're a prayer warrior. You love to pray or, or you love to read or whatever. But there is an area in your life that you have not allowed God to control. This is kind of your secret between you and God. Whatever area that that is, whatever secret that you know, it's kind of an open secret between you and God. You haven't let God have that. You haven't, you haven't given that over to control. It could be how you talk to people. It could be the things you look at and watch. It could be how you lust for money, position, power, prestige. It could be um, you th like things that glitter or you, you, you want an expensive thing and, and someone says no and you ignore the someone. So I love the fact that in this text it says David sent someone. We don't know who the someone is. I love that because that applies so much to us. God puts someone in your life to tell you, stop. Someone in your life to tell you, don't do that anymore. Someone in your life to say, that's not right. Someone in your life, that someone is God whispering in your ear, you can change direction. You don't have to do this anymore. Have you allowed someone in your life to do that for you? That area of your life that, that is kind of your open secret with God your position, your place, the area that causes you to sin, someone to find out about it. Why, David? Why, 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 why did you move further? Why did you, why did you do this? And the man came back. So the man goes and he figures out who was that naked lady that was taking a bath right outside the palace window, and he comes back with this report. He says she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of of Uriah the Hittite. Look at that. Look at this. Here, I don't know. I'm going to pause for a second. 
How many of you have warning lights in your car? How many of you are driving by? Oh, I see a smile over there. You might have a warning light up in your car now. I'm going, oh, I'm just ignoring that warning light. Right? You tend to ignore it. It's there and you go, ah. I had a warning light on my car that um, my tire kept getting low. So what did I do? Did I replace the tire for months? No, I just put more air in it. Right? That's what you do. You got a warning light. I'm just going to ignore the symptom. I'm just going to cover it up. Right? A warning light there. That's why I put the tire because... Um, I needed to do. Ultimately, I got the nail taken out. But you know what? A warning light. Maybe there's a warning light. The warning light is someone. Is someone in your life giving you a warning? Is, is God giving you a warning that this thing has to change? Is God doing that? So she is the daughter of Eliam. How many of you know who Eliam is? How many of you are just going, oh yeah, I know that guy. That's one of the big names in the Old Testament. You guys know that anybody know who that is? Eliam? Oh, I'm looking, I'm looking at people who studied the Bible for a long time, right? We don't know who Eliam is. But she, she is the daughter of Eliam, one of David's mighty men. In other words, she is the son of one of your mighty warriors, David. I mean, she is the daughter of one of your mighty warriors. She comes from a great family. Her, her granddaddy, her granddaddy is one of your counselors, David. David, don't do it. She's, she's the daughter of Elon. You know, the warrior that fights, that, that solves those battles? She's his daughter. And her grandpa is one of your counselors. David, David, don't do it. You can still get out of that situation, David. Here's a warning light. Someone is flashing to David. You can still get out. And then he throws in this next thing. Not only is she the daughter, not only is she the granddaughter, but David, she's married. She has a ring on her finger, David. She's married to, your, 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 um, to Uriah the Hittite. You know who Uriah the Hittite is, right? He, David, David, that's one of your fighting, that's one of your great warriors. He's just not a private in your army. He's a great warrior. He's a fighting warrior. He's a valiant guy. He's a guy of tremendous integrity that we're going to see. He's risking, David, Uriah the Hittite is risking his life for you right now, David. He's in battle under Joab, and they're fighting for you at this moment. David, she's married. Don't do it, David. You can still get out of the situation. If that's not enough, David, David, do you remember this? Someone doesn't say this, but, but I'll help you out. Go back to the book. If you don't like the, the warning lights, go back to the book and say, oh, David, David, was there a historical example that you could look at and say, oh, this is wrong? Go back to Joseph. Joseph, was tempted. Joseph was tempted. She wasn't just taking a bath. She actually came into your presence and she said, come sleep with me. Look at this in Genesis 39, 6 and 7. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. She tried to seduce him. And Joseph left that first time. Joseph said, no, I can't do it. Why would I do all that damage against my boss? Why would I do that? And so, turn the page, turn a couple of verses later in Genesis 39, and she does it again. One day, he went to the house to attend to his duties, and there was no one home. No one was inside the house. His boss, Potiphar, he was out, he was out doing whatever Potiphar did, and, and the servants were out mending the fields, and it's just Joseph and Potiphar's wife. No one would know. Absolute secrecy. She caught him by this cloak and she said, come to bed with me. Come to bed. What was she wearing? Or did she come prepared to seduce him, entice him? Joseph, come to bed with me. And he left his cloak and he ran out of the house. Joseph said, absolutely not. And that cost Joseph tremendously. And, and it cost him his prestige and he was thrown into the jail because she lies. But Joseph is an example of when temptation came. He ran away from it, even at great cost. David doesn't do that. David doesn't run away from temptation. David ran toward temptation. He's running after, and I like that picture of the cliff. That's exactly what happens when you run toward temptation, when you embrace it, when you go, no one's going to notice. I can hide this. It's okay. It'll be a secret. What if that someone could have told him the consequences of the sin. 
So, so that someone, what if that someone would have told him, Joseph, no. What if that someone would have had a prophetic look into the future and said, David, if you do this deed with Bathsheba, this is what's going to happen to your house. Let me tell you what this guy would have said. There'll be an unwanted pregnancy. David, you're not going to want to sleep with Bathsheba because she's going to become pregnant. David, you're not going to want to do this because once she becomes pregnant, you're going to end up murdering a trusted, loyal, faithful warrior. You're not going to want to do this, David. David, you're not going to want to do this because that baby is going to die. David, David, will you, can you tell the future? If I could tell you the future, no, David, don't. David, not only that, but, but the promise, you got another promise coming from the Lord. It is that the sword will never depart from your house if you do this, David. If you do this, David, if you kill Uriah and you sleep with Bathsheba, and you try to hide that sin, David, the sword will never pass from your house. And once the sword enters your house, your daughter will be raped by her brother. Do you want that, David? David, one of your sons will murder another one of your sons. The sword will never depart from your house. David, if you do this, David, if you do this, one of your sons will start a civil war. David, if you do this, one of your sons will follow your example of the lack of self-control and will lead much of Israel away from God. Church, I don't know if the, that something that you're thinking about in your mind, I don't know whether that thing that you're hiding from, that, that, that known secret that you wrestle with, that, that issue, whether it's the words you use and, and how you speak about other people and you just continually do it, you don't think God's paying attention, you don't think God's watching, you don't, you don't worry about that but you're kind and considerate. You help the poor. You, you, you pray for people. Oh, but that open sin, if you knew the consequences, the people whose reputations you've ruined, and, and maybe if you could see the results of your sin, would you continue to live in it? Would you continue to participate in it? Would you continue to disobey God? Would David have done it if he had known? And so today's message is kind of a warning. It's a warning that says sin is a serious issue. And we just can't neglect it. We just can't say, okay, I got 90% of my life going good. Okay, I pray a lot. I read my Bible. But, you know, I do this thing. This thing. I got this thing in which, which I don't have any control over and never have any control over, and I just can't stop. I've never let someone into my life to help me get over it. Never let someone into my life to help me walk through it, to help me with it. I've never allowed someone to provide counsel for me in it. Would David have done it? We'll pick up the passage again. Then David sent messengers to get her, and, he, and she came to him, and he slept with her. Now a little parenthetical spot added, just so that we know that the baby is David's. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanliness. And then she went back home. David and Bathsheba had sexual relations. And then she went back home. David committed adultery. Married man slept with a married woman. You know, we call it an affair because we like to make things happy, right? We don't like to judge people. We don't like to say, you're committing adultery. And so we call it, oh, you're having an affair. God calls it adultery. We like to say, oh, it was just love. God calls it lust. We like to say, oh, oh, it was just sex. God calls it sin. We like to say, oh, oh, it was romantic. God calls it ruin in a marriage, in a relationship. It will never be the same. We say it's destiny. Oh, oh, I found, I found, I'm married, but I found the person of my destiny. Oh, really? God says it's destruction. The families will never be the same. And the woman conceived. And she said, I'm pregnant. She, she took the test. <laughs> and having looked at a lot of images of those tests, trying to find that one, I can see why y'all can't figure those things out. All right? Is it one line or two? I don't know. You know, how many of those do you got to take before you go, oh yeah, this two, it's one, I don't know, right? And then all of a sudden, she comes back to David and says, I'm pregnant. And David says, he panics, he plans, and he plots. 
And then David, one of the things David doesn't do, he doesn't do this for a full year, church. He doesn't go to God and he doesn't confess it. We're going to see next week when we do part B of this message is that David says, my bones wasted away while I kept this a secret. I wonder how many of you your bones are just wasting away because there's a secret that you've never given over to God. Unconfessed sin. So David panics, David plans, and then David plots. So David sent word to Joab. This, this is the plan. Hey, send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab doesn't know what's going on, so Joab, he sends him David's, he sends him Uriah. Panic, phase one. Okay, David says, I'm just going to play it cool. I'm going to play it cool. Hey, Uriah. Uriah. Give me the news from the field. Give me the news from your field. And then he's going to say, now that you're home, why don't you go sleep in your own bed? Wink, wink, right? And so Uriah came to David. And David asked him, how was Joab? Hey, you know, like, like David carries at this moment, right? Hey, Uriah, how's Joab doing? How's my buddy Joab doing? How's the warriors going? How are the soldiers who are? And how's the war going? Uriah, come on, update me on that. And verse 8 says, then David said, the real key, Ah, uh, go to your house and wash your feet. Go on, Uriah, go on home. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after, the, after him. What do you think that gift was? Yeah, a little love wine, right? Maybe, I don't know what that gift was, but David's trying to prime the pump. And, but he's talking to Uriah, the Hittite. But Uriah, he slept at the entrance to the palace, with all of his master's servants. Uriah slept on the ground with his mat in front of the palace, David's home, with all of David's servants, and he did not go down to his house. Uriah the Hittite, what a man of great integrity. So plan one, hey, 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 play it cool. David played it cool, and so David does this. Oh, plan two, buy some time. So I'm going to buy some time, and so the next day, David says, David finds out Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you come from a military campaign? Why don't you go home? Uriah said, you kidding, David? The Ark of Israel and Judah are stained in tents. Look, look up there. The, the Ark of God is in a tent. And look at that. My men, my men are, are my friends and, and my commanders are all out in the fields, David. And they're, they're sleeping out in the open country. They're risking their life. And you want me to go to my house and sleep on my comfortable bed underneath my down blankets with my beautiful wife? I cannot do it. I would betray God and my, betray my men. I'd betray you, David. There's no way I can do it. And so David said to him, ah, stay here one more day and tomorrow I'll send you back. And so Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. Plan three. Phase three, get him drunk. All us fellas, you know, buy the guy a burnt drink. Let's see if we can crack his, crack his integrity. And so David, in, at David's invitation, what? He had a big feast and he made him drink with him. And David made him drunk. Wow. This is the man of God. This is God's chosen man. And he's just trying to cover up his sin. David made him drunk. But in the evening... Uriah, as drunk as he was, kind of walking all wobbly, doesn't go to his house. Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master servants, and he did not go home. And David panics, and David plans, and phase four, David plots. It gets worse. It gets worse. David is now kind of in a full panic mode. He's got to cover it up. He's got to hide. He's got to continue to hide this. What if, oh, I, I don't know what to do next. And so he does the worst possible thing. He sends note to have Uriah the Hittite killed. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. Can you imagine that? Here's Uriah carrying this note. He doesn't even look at it. He doesn't open it up. He, doesn't, he just carries this note back to Jacob. And the note says this. Put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fierce and then withdraw so that he will be struck down and die. And Uriah the Hittite never opens up that note, is never even tempted, and he takes that note to Joab, hands it to Joab, says this came from the king, 
steps away, goes out, and Jacob reads it. I'm sorry, Joab reads it. Wow. And so this is what happens. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men, not just Uriah, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. David's plan, kill Uriah, also included the killing of other men in his army. David fell. David fell because he was covering up a sin. He, 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 he ended up going all this way. And, and we wonder, why do people, you know, you see them circling, you see them circling the drain, and, and how did they get there? Maybe they got there doing the same steps that David did. They, they tried to, they, 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 they were too embarrassed, too filled with shame, too unrepentant. And so what do they do? They got to keep covering, keep covering. And pretty soon they, they don't realize how far they've gone. And I think all of us know people like that. They were, they were leading, they were following, they were great ministry leaders. And pretty soon they're no longer there. They've fallen they're, they're too embarrassed to share what happened. And so they just make things worse and worse and worse, and things get worse and worse and worse. With the news of Uriah the Hittite dead, David thinks he's in the clear. David thinks he's in the clear. So Joab sent a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, and the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you, didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the walls? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks this, say to him, moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Wow. Job knows how to play that ace card, doesn't he? And so the messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything that Joab had said, told him to say. The messenger said to David, the, the men overpowered us and, and came up against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. And when the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, some of the king's men died. Some. More than Uriah. Some of them died. And moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. And David's response he thinks he's in the clear. David's response is, no one will know about me and Bathsheba. No one will know. I'll be in the clear. I've got one more step to take. David told the messenger, say this to Joab. Ah, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. Wow. David is more concerned about you know, anybody finding out about his sin with Bathsheba than he is about the death of one of his mighty men. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. Now come phase five. The complete cover-up is there. And the cover-up is clean. It looks good. And, and so the complete cover-up is succeeded. She mourns for Uriah. And then after a time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife. And she bore him a son. How long does it take? Nine months, right? Nine months and she bore him a son. Did you see that? And she bore him a son. It took time. This is, this is a period of time. It wasn't just all this didn't happen in a week. A period of time. David is, is leaning into his sinful behavior. He's leaning into this, this issue and, and it worked. Got it all covered up. Except for one thing. Verse 27 at the end of that verse, it says this, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Oh, the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. If you have a Bible open, underline that verse because that part of it, because David had it covered, man. Nobody knew. This is great. A married Bathsheba. You know, maybe some of the servants are doing, I'm doing counting on my fingers of, of when you said I do versus when the baby came out. And they, you know, they're not adding up. I don't get it. And maybe some of them are adding that up. But you know what? He feels like he's got it covered. They're his servants. Who cares what they say? David's good. Life is good. 
It's been nine, ten months. I got a boy. Yay, I got a baby boy. But the things that David did displeased the Lord. We talked about you. Maybe there's something in your life. Maybe there's not, but maybe there's something in your life. I was reading in my devotions this verse this week, and it said this. What is mankind that you make so much of them? That you give them so much attention? That you examine them every morning and you test them every moment? Church, there's not a one of you who can hide anything you do from God. There's not a person in here who can have a secret sin away from God. God knows everything. He's watching you. Every morning he examines you and he tests you every moment in the poetic language. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. God is always watching you. Jesus reminds us over and over and over again in Matthew chapter 6. Your father sees what is done in secret. Your father sees what is done in secret. Your father sees what is done in secret. Church, in a moment, we're going to take these elements. And before you take those elements, before you hold the body of Christ in your hand, the symbol of the body of Christ, if there's some sin you need to confess to God and say, God, I am so sorry. If there's an issue in your life that you need to deal with, you might want to just pass it up and say, God, I can't, I can't deal with it at this moment, at this place. I've got to go make restitution with my friend. I've got, go, got to go make it right because I have been living a lie. I have been living a lie. See, I confess that you're Lord, but I don't live like it. I confess that you're my Savior, but I'm not dependent upon you. If there's something in your life that you know that God has pointed out God is in your life, and yet you're living this area of your life before you in the quietness of the church. So God, forgive me. Jesus, thank you for forgiving me. If there's some of you who have never accepted Jesus Christ, and you stand before him, all of your sins are right there, and you don't have anything to protect you from his wrath. You're guilty. But the good news of the gospel is, the good news of the gospel is that Jesus died for us. That he has forgiven us all of our sins. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you bow your knee and say, Lord Jesus, come into my life, God the Father looks at you through the death of Jesus Christ and through his righteousness. And what the text is saying is that just get your life right with God. Get out of that sinful behavior. Get out of that sinful moment and live a life that honors God because God sees what is done in secret. So church, if there's something in secret in your life before you come take these elements, just confess it and then come and rejoice and celebrate with what God has done. I heard these lyrics by this musician named Ben Fuller. The song is called, Who Am I? And the lyrics go in part like this. It says, I stand in front of the mirror, but I don't like who's looking back at me. Wish I could see things clearer, like who I'm supposed to be. In every trial, lift me higher, through the fire, hold me tighter, remind me again that I was made for more. Who am I in the eyes of the Lord? Who am I, his love set free? Who was, who I was, I left at the altar. I am yours, I believe. So this morning when you come, take the bread and you take the cup. Leave who you were at the table. Just leave it and say, God, I know who I was and I want to leave it at the table and now I accept you for who you are this morning. So let's take some time and take the elements and have a time of communion, if you will, communion with God at his table. If I can ask Cleet and Rich to come. And what 
they're going to do is they're going to stand at the tables and they're really just going to be praying over you as you come forward. There might be a few of you who have some things that you just need to leave at the table. Just let them pray over you and if you need them to pray with you, they'll gladly pray with you. And then come, take a cracker, take a cup and after everybody has the cup, everybody has the cracker, we're going to eat this in unity together knowing that it is only by the grace of God, the absolute grace of God, that we can take the bread and break it together. We can take the cup and drink it together. None of us are righteous on our own. It is only through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that we can come to the table. So if you've accepted Jesus Christ and you love Jesus Christ, come to the table, get the elements, and come, please come forward. The text says in Luke 22, the hour came, Jesus and his apostles were reclining at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not drink it again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our church, what we love to do is we love to take the bread, open the bread up, and love to break it, reminding ourselves that he is broken for us. He's broken for us. So church, take, eat, in remembrance of his brokenness for us. Amen. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is being poured out for you. Take and drink it in remembrance of him. Let's drink in celebration of what he did for us. I always love this time at the table time where the church comes together and they remember what Jesus has done for us. Not just what he's done for me, but what he's done for us. And we can taste his goodness. We can taste his love. We can taste his grace flowing through us. And one of the ways that we express the grace of God is sometimes there are people who need just a helping hand. And so every Sunday we have this elder fund. You probably got an envelope when you came in, just the elder fund. That just allows us to help people who have a need. And you know, whether it is 30 bucks because they just need gas. Well, now it's 50 bucks because they just need gas. Or um, they have problems making the rent. And so because of your generosity in the elder fund, we've been able to help many people. So make sure that you put the regular offering and the elder fund in the silver mailbox right by the exit door as you leave. Let me pray for us and then Ben will close us in a song. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for this opportunity to taste how good you are to us. 
Lord, thanks for your forgiveness and your grace in the midst of this moment. Lord, thanks for your forgiveness for those sins that someone has told us about. And Lord, the fact that we now just need to obey and to listen. Fill us, Lord, with your presence as we are lights to those in the dark world. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you very much for watching. There are just a couple of steps that we want you to take. And if you have your phone with you, just scan the QR code, or if you're watching on your phone, simply tap on the link. The link will take you to a couple of things. One, a place to donate. It's always important that we're faithful in giving back to God. If he has blessed us, we're blessed to be a blessing. So we would ask you to give generously to the church. Two, to connect with us. Let us know who you are. Let us know who you are. And three, how to pray for you. We love to pray for you. And so we, uh, I can testify I've seen God work miracles. And so we'd love to see and join in prayer for you. Also, we'd love for you to come and visit. So just make way and come on a Sunday morning and visit. That way you get to see the live version of it instead of the live stream version of it. And if you have any questions, feel free to text those as well. But make sure that you subscribe. That becomes important to us. And make sure that you also like this video. The more people that like the video, the more people it will reach. So thank you very much for watching and have a blessed day.